Okay, hi everybody, and uh, welcome to Chicago's Best Ideas. I'm about to prove the title's wrong, but, uh, but bear with me. I'm David Strauss. Um, uh, let me, the, the, my subject is campaign finance and what I call campaign finance first principles. Let me sort of say what I mean by that. We're, we're talking generally about the, um, uh, uh, the regulation of uh, contributions to political campaigns and expenditures in support of political candidates for various offices, president and, and lower offices as well. It's a complicated subject and I'm really sort of going to focus on one piece of it, the piece that has to do with the Constitution and the courts. So let me be more specific about that. Beginning in the mid-1970s, there was a wave of legislation restricting people's ability to contribute money to campaigns or spend money in support of campaigns. There had been some laws, state and federal, before that, but there was a great wave in the uh, mid-70s in response to the Watergate scandal. Those laws were challenged, the federal laws in particular, were challenged as a violation of the First Amendment. The argument was that these sorts of expenditures in support of campaigns are a kind of speech. They're integral, integrally tied up with political speech and the First Amendment protects political speech and therefore these laws were unconstitutional. In a case called Buckley against Vallejo, which the name of which I wrote up on the board in 1976, the court struck down some of these laws and upheld others. And Buckley against Vallejo sort of laid out a way of thinking about these laws that has stayed with us ever since. And what I really want to do is to sort of challenge that way of thinking about these laws. It is now sort of woven into the doctrine. You would have to do major work on the state of the law to change it, but that's why I'm thinking of this as first principles rather than something that's operating within the established doctrine. So let me um, say what Buckley against Vallejo uh, did first. There were two, two really important things that the Supreme Court did in that case that, that, that have, as I said, sort of um, determined what the framework would be from now on. The first was, uh, um, what I have down here, equality and corruption. The first thing the um, Supreme Court did was to say the only legitimate concern of campaign finance laws is potential corruption, corruption and the appearance of corruption, that money spent in support of or contributed to campaigns will corrupt office holders. They said that's a legitimate concern. And uh, campaign contributions and uh, expenditures can be regulated in order to avoid the risk of corruption. Um, they also, the court also, this is really critical to the development of the law, also said here's something that is not a legitimate interest at all, the interest in equalizing people's ability to be influential. That is just not a legitimate interest. That's off the table. And to the extent these regulations are designed to promote equality, they are no good. And the key sentence in Bugley against Vallejo goes like this, I'm, qu I'm quoting, the concept that government may restrict the speech of some in order to enhance the relative voice of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. The concept that the government can restrict the speech of some in order to enhance the relative voice of others wholly foreign to the First Amendment. People who are critical of the court's work in this area take that as their bete noir. That's, that's the sentence that got us off on the wrong footing, and I actually agree with that for reasons I'll get into uh, in a second. But that's, that's in any event what Buckley um, said. Now, uh, having sort of laid that out as the premise, the court in Buckley then drew a distinction, and this is the, 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 uh, number, the third thing I have on the board, between contributions and expenditures. Um, this is a distinction that the court invented in that case, and it has again come to structure the law in this area. Uh, the court said ever since, the court said there's a difference between contributions to a campaign where you write a check to Obama for America or the Romney campaign or a congressional campaign on the one hand and expenditures in support of a campaign where you yourself take out an ad in a newspaper or hire someone to uh, go on TV and make an ad for you or something like that where you yourself do that out of your own pocket and don't coordinate with the campaign. And what the court said in both against Vallejo is that the essentially the government cannot restrict expenditures. They sort of left open a certain very limited qualifications. But basically, if you're just spending money to run an ad saying, here's my candidate, vote for him, you're speaking and the government can't touch that. Contributions, the court said, the government can restrict. It can't forbid them, but it can, for example, impose pretty strict ceilings on how much any individual 
can contribute. Now it's $5,000 a person. It's been adjusted for inflation over the years. So contributions can be limited, expenditures cannot. The thinking behind this goes back to the corruption point. The court's idea was, well, if you're contributing to a campaign, giving, handing money over, writing a check to the candidate or the candidate's <coughs> campaign workers, there's a risk of corruption there. There's a risk that you'll get something or want something in return. There'll be an explicit bargain, an implicit bargain there. That's the risk. Whereas if you're just spending money independently in support of the campaign, the risk of that kind of corruption is minimal, so the court said. The idea was these expenditures have to be truly uncoordinated. They can't be kind of coordinated behind the scenes. You can't go to the campaign and say, you know, where would you like some ads to be run? And they say, Nevada, and you say, oh, Cal runs some ads. No, that's no good. It has to be your own independent expenditure. But the court said when that's going on, the risk of corruption is uh, so small that the government cannot restrict expenditures. There's a little bit of a a little bit of a qualification for that, but not important for our, our purposes um, uh, right now. Um, now, one thing that happened over, the, over time, Buckley was in 76, and the framework really, the courts have been working within that framework ever since, right, to the present day. The notion of, one thing that happened is the notion of corruption is never really pinned down. Um, a, a bribe, an explicit exchange, I'll give you this contribution and in exchange you have to agree to vote for my program. Now that's a, that's a crime, that's a felony, that's illegal already under any, any law. Um, uh, so you don't need the campaign finance laws to make that illegal. The idea was somehow that in order to get at the risk of that, or the court sometimes talked about the appearance of that, that that kind of exchange, the quid pro quo exchange, that may not be going on but people in, in, in the public will think it's going on, and that's why you have to restrict contributions. That notion was always a little bit fuzzy about exactly what this corruption was we are worried about. That was sort of ill-defined. Um, since, after all, the core example of a bribe was already illegal. So we were trying to get at something peripheral or something prophylactic, and that was all kind of left fuzzy. Over time, some opinions uh, of the Supreme Court uh, it, it defined corruption more and more broadly. Uh, and there are opinions saying, well, big money has a corrupting influence on campaigns. You know, when someone's making a big contribution, that's corrupting and people lose faith in their government. Um, and that interpretation of the word corruption, that notion of corruption, you see that's starting to veer over into the equality concern. When, the, when the, the talk is about the corrupting influence of big money and people will respond to the people with, the politicians will respond to the people with money rather than the, the, rather than the average voter, uh, and that's corruption. When you use corruption that way, that's starting to look more like equality, and the court had ruled equality out. Um, so what happened was in some cases, some Supreme Court opinions, depending on who was writing the majority opinion, began to interpret corruption more and more um, broadly uh, and to use that as a reason for a justification for regulations. The very controversial decision a couple of years ago in a case called Citizens United, one thing that Citizens United did, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story here, but just to sort of complete that thought, one thing that Citizens United did was to close the door on that sort of expansion of the notion of corruption and to say, no, we're not, we're not going to let, you, uh, let uh, uh, you, our colleagues on the Supreme Court or the lower courts, use the word corruption in a way that really begins to to uh, bring into the picture ideas of, of equality. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the, um, uh, the framework. Now, let me say a word about Citizens United since it was so controversial before I ask the question whether this whole structure um, really makes a lot of sense. What happened was, um, uh, was, was this. There were on the books, and have been on the books for a long time, uh, since 1907, in some cases, since the 1940s and other cases, restrictions on the ability of corporations and labor unions to spend money from their treasuries uh, in support of political campaigns. And these restrictions were on both contributions to the campaigns and independent expenditures in support of the campaigns. They were uh, restrictions on expenditures out of the treasury. So it wasn't a restriction on the ability of the CEO of a corporation to write a check. That was handled by this contribution expenditure framework. It was restrictions on the ability of the CEO to write a check on ExxonMobil's bank account, um, or on the ability of a leader of a labor union to write a check on labor union funds collected by member dues. And those restrictions were very sweeping. They said that um, unions and corporations cannot, well not very sweeping, fairly, fairly sweeping, 
Unions and corporations cannot make contributions to political campaigns. That was one restriction. That's still around. They cannot make direct contributions to political campaigns. In addition, what the law tried to do was to say, you know, even if you're not contributing directly to the campaign, if you're making an expenditure in support of a candidate, we don't want you to do that, even if you're doing it independently. We want to draw a line between advertising on issues, which we want corporations and labor unions to be free to do, and advertising in support of candidates, which we don't want them to do. That's what these laws tried to do. That was, this was the issue in Citizens United. Now, there are obvious line drawing problems there about when an advertisement is supporting a candidate or opposing a candidate, and when it's addressing an issue. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how if you wanted to support a particular candidate but didn't want to look like you were supporting the candidate, you could dress up your advertisement as an issue um, uh, advertisement. You just pick an issue that was identified with one candidate or another, don't mention the candidate's name, and hammer at the, um, uh, hammer at the uh, uh, issue. You know, Health care used to be a problem. 30 million people were uninsured. Uh, uh, now they are insured. America is a better place than it was four years ago. Okay? Doesn't mention anybody's name, but that's obviously supporting President Obama in the last, um, uh, in the last election. Uh, etc. Um, so what you had was a series of laws and regulations that tried to, to, to walk this line and say, you know, labor unions, corporations, if you want to advertise on issues, that's fine. If you want to support candidates, that's not. And we're going to have a bunch of criteria. What's in the ad? When does the ad come out? Does it come out in the immediate run-up to the election? Does it come out long before to try to draw this line? The other line-drawing problem, a very, a very, uh, also a very difficult one, was this. These laws applied to corporations, also labor unions, but corporations. Now, a corporate form is just a form of association people can choose, and they want to take advantage of certain aspects, as you know, of the, of the, of the law. It provides for limited liability and, um, uh, and certain tax advantages. Um, but you could have a corporation, something that was legally formally a corporation, that was just a group interested in making some political or ideological point. You could get together with your buddies and say, we all support a certain cause, or we all support a certain candidate. Let's pool our resources, divide labor, hire some people. Well, how are we going to do this? Are we just going to get together as a partnership? No, I think it would be more advantageous to take corporate form. And so you have groups like that. Um, and the law had to sort of deal with the fact that corporations include both you know, corporations that have their major purpose, something nothing to do with politics, the usual sort of publicly held large corporation, and these things that assume corporate form, but they were really Political, politically interested groups that had a cause. And it seemed um, unreasonable and, and really a problem to say to those groups, well, you can't advertise in support of a, uh, of a candidate. Um, so these line drawing problems um, were present. The other big line drawing problem, by the way, has to do with media companies. Um, most major news outlets are organized as corporations. What happens when they write an editorial endorsing President Obama or Governor Romney for president. Well, there you have a corporation endorsing a candidate. Um, uh, and it looks like that's illegal. So there had to be a carve out for media corporations, too. So there are a lot of problems. And that was the issue in Citizens United. And what Citizens United said was, we're going to apply the same rules about uh, contributions and expenditures to corporations and unions that we apply elsewhere. Contributions, no good. Expenditures, fine. And we're going to get rid of this idea that expenditures in support of a candidate coming from a corporate union treasury are illegal. That's, that, that prohibition is now unconstitutional. Uh, corporations and unions are free to spend money in support of a candidate. They still can't contribute to the campaign, but they can spend money out of the Treasury in support of the candidate. That was the decision in Citizens United. That particular piece of the decision uh, turned out to be, it was very controversial, turned out to have less of an effect than you might think. Um, because it turns out that most sort of large publicly held corporations, the Exxon Mobiles, the Apples, the Googles of the world, aren't that interested in wading into political campaigns. Uh, you know, uh, 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 half of their customers, more or less, are going to be voting for the person that they just campaigned against, and they don't particularly want to do that. So they will run issue ads. Exxon Mobil advertised about global warming. Google advertised about intellectual property. But um, they just aren't that interested in running ads saying re-elect President Obama or vote for Governor Romney. They're just not interested in doing that. So that piece of Citizens United turned out to have, so far at least, have less of an effect than people thought. What did have an effect was what I said before, that Citizens United really clamped down on this idea. When we say equality is not 
the concern, we mean it. And you cannot limit corporate expenditures because you're worried that corporations have too much money and will be too influential. And you can only limit people spending money because of a concern with corruption, and that means, according to our cases since 1976, the only thing you can limit is contributions, not independent expenditures. Um, and th that, that part of Citizens United, that's what, kind of, that's what influenced um, uh, the landscape because what happened after that was it, the doors were open for individuals to contribute unlimited amounts of money in support of independent advertisements. And that's why you see these groups, these so-called super PACs, which do not make contributions to the campaigns, they run ads of their own. Uh, independently, formally not coordinated with the campaign, but they are free to run ads that are as aggressive as they want them to be in support of or against the candidate. So these super PACs can collect unlimited amounts of money from, they could collect them from corporations, but corporations usually don't contribute. I mean, corporations at the time, the sort of publicly held corporations usually don't contribute. They can collect unlimited amounts of money from individuals. Uh, and they can run ads that explicitly target candidates. Uh, and that was the thing that followed from Citizens United. And this insistence by the court that no, we, we, the only thing we care about, the only thing you can regulate is contributions. You cannot regulate expenditures. Um, the other piece of this, by the way, just to fill out the story, is, uh, is a disclosure. Um, whether it's possible to know who is contributing this money that is being used to run these ads. There are disclosures, it's a complicated regime. There are disclosure requirements in place, but they are relatively easy to evade in various ways. Disclosures only have to be made at certain intervals, so you can contribute in a way that so that your identity doesn't become public for a while. If you do it late in the campaign, it will not become public until after the election. Um, and the other thing people do is to set up various kinds of corporate structures that conceal who the actual donor is. So the donation will come from some firm with some anodyne title that you've never heard of, well, where, where does that firm come from? Well, you have to sort of trace it back. Well, who set up that, that corporation? Well, set up by some other corporation. Well, who set up that? Um, and if you're really diligent, you might be able to unwind it all and find that it's, ah, it's this rich guy. He's behind it all, but it takes a lot of work. Um, so that's, that's the deal. Uh, now, uh, so that's, that's the state of the law. This is where, what I think got off on the wrong foot. This isn't an argument about sort of what the next case should say. It's an argument about if you wanted to rethink this entire area of the law, how would you rethink it? And it seems to me this corruption equality idea that the court gave us in Buckley and Vallejo, uh, I think that's exactly backward. I think they got it exactly backward. Uh, I think corruption is not um, uh, the proper concern of the campaign finance laws, at least in any way that matters a lot, and I think equality ought to be a uh, concern. Now, obviously, corruption in the sense of bribery is a bad thing, though it will be made illegal, but to erect this entire structure of strictly limited contributions, no limits on expenditures to prevent that just seems very misaimed. Um, that if you're interested in, in kind of working out a kind of an under-the-table exchange with a politician, the idea that contributions pose so much more of a risk than an expenditure, and that sort of an implicit deal, you know, <coughs> Um, uh, I'll spend a lot of money in support of you, but in return, I need your vote on this issue. Those deals seem to be every bit as possible, or nearly so, as deals involving contributions and should be policed through the bribery laws. On the other hand, um, once you get past bribery, which is sometimes not all that easy to define anyway, it's not clear what corruption means. And this is why you had this sloppiness in the cases about exactly what corruption is. So let me, let me give you this thought experiment. Supposing everybody in the country had the same amount of money, just suppose. Um, and now we had a regime in which there were unlimited political contributions. You could spend as much as you wanted, any way you wanted, in support of a candidate. Anyone could do it. Um, would corruption be a concern there? You'd still have the concern about bribery. But would you have a concern that some people were too influential, um, uh, or there was a corrupting influence on money? It seems to me you would not. Uh, it seems to me you'd say, well, people really care. will spend more of their money in support of a candidate, and that's fine. If they really care, they ought to be able to spend more of their money. If they don't care, they won't spend money. And the influence people have will correspond to, only to, how much they care. And that's not a problem. That's sort of something we want in a democracy. Uh, what that suggests to me, what that thought experiment suggests to me, is that the problem is equality. The problem is, or inequality, 
the problem is not corruption in any, um, in any meaningful sense, uh, unless you define corruption in terms of uh, equality. Here's another way to think about it. I said, supposing everybody has an equal amount of money, now are you troubled by a regime in which spend money any way you want in connection with politics? Substitute votes for money. Now, we each have one vote. We get to allocate that any way we want. If you don't care enough about an election, you don't vote. Um, does it matter whether what we're expending is votes instead of dollars? It seems to me not obvious that it does. Um, and what that suggests, it seems to me, is that the problem is equality. And the court just got it wrong when it said equality is not the issue. Uh, voting is the issue. Now, that's not to say, uh, equality is not the issue, corruption is the issue. Now, that's not to say there aren't concerns here. You could be concerned, well, you know, yeah, even if everybody has equal amounts of money, you could have concerns about interest groups, that interest groups will organize, and members of interest groups will concentrate their resources on particular uh, members of Congress, say. I will all say, you know, give your money, you know, we know you don't have that much, you know, more than the next guy, but give what you have to this member of Congress because we want him or her to be reelected uh, to support our interest group. You could have that. You have that with voting, too, um, where interest groups get together and say, you know, let's make sure this person doesn't win reelection. Uh, she's been hostile to our interests. Uh, let's make sure this person does. He's been on our side. So it seems to me that's the source of the uh, uh, concern here. The concern is um, uh, uh, inequality. When the Supreme Court said, you know, it is, it is wholly foreign to the First Amendment to restrict the speech of some in order to enhance the relative voice of others, wholly foreign to the First Amendment, you know, it seems to me, in order to see why that was wrong, they didn't need to look literally much further than past their respective judicial noses. Um, uh, because um, when you argue cases before the Supreme Court, you will see that you stand up there and there's a lectern and there are lights on the lectern. And at some point, the red light, each side gets a half an hour in a normal case. At some point, the light goes off and you have to sit down uh, and be quiet. Uh, if you, if when the light went off, you kept talking, and when the Chief Justice said to you with increasing degrees of impatience, I'm sorry, your time is up, it's time for the other counsel, if you said, wait a minute, you're restricting my speech in order to enhance the relative value of my opponent over there. That's, that's wholly foreign to the First Amendment. <laughs> wholly foreign to the First Amendment. Right? I, don't do it. You don't think you'll get very far with that. Um, right? But that's what goes, that's, what, that's why the light goes off. The light goes off because you get a half an hour and the other side gets a half an hour. And the reason you don't get more than a half an hour is we want to make sure the other side has equal time. We're restricting your speech in order to make sure that he has more opportunity. Uh, now, as an example, is a little bit obviously there's some, uh, some uh, questions you could raise about that example. But, the, I, but the, the point is that there are many contexts in which we do quite consciously try to equalize the amount of time people have to speak. And I'll tell you one thing that I bet the Supreme Court would not do. The Supreme Court would not say, well, you know, we're, we're going to take our own dictum in Buckley against Valeria. We're going to take it to heart. Here's how we're going to allocate uh, argument time in future cases, and for that matter, pages of briefs. There's also a limit on the number of pages you can have in your brief. Um, we're, going to let, we're going to put it up for bidding, uh, and we'll auction off blocks of time. And if you can buy all the time, and your opponent doesn't buy any, you get to talk the whole time. Um, uh, and that's how we'll decide. It's crazy, right? You never do that. There are many, many settings in which you would never do that. Uh, if you're at a convention of scientists trying to debate some scientific question, the idea that you allocate debate time according to who has more money or who's willing to pay more money to debate, well, that would be a problem. Um, uh, that would undermine the entire enterprise. So in fact, the idea that you try to equalize the amount of speech power people have, that's not wholly foreign to the First Amendment at all. There are many contexts in which that's exactly what we try to do, which we try to say we're not going to allow someone to monopolize the forum in a way that squeezes everybody else to the sidelines. Now, that's as a matter of principle. And if you're talking about a nice, orderly argument in the court, you can administer that very easily, 30 minutes aside. Um, if you're talking about the rough and tumble of political debate, it's a fair question to say, well, OK, I, maybe in principle you want equality. How on earth are you going to implement that? How on earth are you going to divide things up uh, evenly in the political um, uh, realm? And that, I think, is a, is a legitimate, um, uh, a legitimate uh, concern. And I'll get back to that in a second, uh, to say, look, uh, uh, 
Uh, in principle, yes, okay, maybe we were wrong to say equalizing things is wholly foreign to the First Amendment, but what maybe the way to phrase the point is when you try to equalize things, there's a real danger that you will do harm to the values underlying the First Amendment in the guise of equalizing things. That seems to me to be a, um, uh, a, legitimate, com uh, a legitimate concern. But let me, let me say a few more things before I get back to trying to address that concern, which is, which is, which is hard, to, uh, hard to address. Um, somehow, what fits in here for me, and I don't know quite how it fits in, but um, uh, a, a piece of this has to do with vote buying. It's illegal to buy and sell votes. Um, you can't do it. And there's a question, I think, a puzzle about why that is. I mean, after all, if, uh, if you're willing to sell your vote to me and I'm willing to pay for it, why shouldn't I exercise your vote? It means more to me than it does to you. You don't have to sell it. Um, but if you choose to sell it, why shouldn't I buy it? Well, you can't, and that's very well established. And I don't know of any uh, functioning democracy in which vote buying and selling is allowed. So the intuition that it's no good is very strong. Um, but the question about why exactly it's not acceptable, if someone doesn't care enough and is willing to give up the vote, why not let them? Um, that into it seems to me that is somehow connected to this point, that no, we want there to be a degree of equality in the political realm. We don't want people with more money to be able to get more votes, even if it would be to the advantage of the people who are selling um, uh, the votes. Of course, the clearest statement of this is the principle one person, one vote. Everybody gets one vote. You can't have an election in which there's weighted voting. You can't say, for example, oh, here's a segment of the electorate that's smarter. They get two votes. That would be all of us. Um, uh, or say a, a, or a, a principle that says, here's a segment of the electorate that is more at stake in this election. Uh, they get more votes. You can't do that. One person, one vote. Um, that's, the region, that's the rule in, in under our Constitution and the rule under uh, nearly, every, um, <coughs> uh, nearly every mature, um, uh, mature democracy. So one way to encapsulate where I think the Supreme Court went off the tracks, and this is the first thing I put up there, they thought about campaign contributions as simply a matter of speech. This is speech. Um, you're restricting people's speech. Spending in connection with campaigns, yes, it's speech, but it's also connected to voting. Um, because spending in connection with campaigns, the characteristic feature of that spending is you're trying to influence people's votes. You're not just trying to affect their views, you're trying to affect their votes that ideally what you'd like to do if you're spending money in connection with a political campaign is to, sh is to shift votes. So spending in political campaigns, yes, it has something to do with speech. It also has something to do with voting. And when the Supreme Court said equalizing things is wholly foreign to the First Amendment, it was simply losing sight of the fact, what seems to me a fact, that in the realm of voting, we insist on absolutely strict equality, one person, one vote. Yes, in the realm of speech, it's tricky to figure out how to implement equality. In the realm of voting, we have to insist on it. And I think this body of law, just the, the court just missed the boat in not seeing that this involved voting and not just speech. This makes the problem more complicated, but it's also a more accurate description of what's, um, of what's going on. So that's why I think the court kind of got off on the wrong foot by saying equality is not a legitimate concern here. I think it is. By treating this simply as speech, I think it's a matter of voting as well as speech, um, and, by, uh, uh, and by emphasizing this corruption idea which was, uh, was ill-defined. Okay, so just how do we, if, if all of that is right, um, how do we implement it? Equality in the courtroom, that's easy to figure out. Equality in a meeting, everybody speaks for an equal amount of time. Those things, that's easy to implement equality. Implementing in political debate is much trickier. One proposal that comes around a lot, and it's a, it's a good idea, is to use some form of vouchers. Um, this would be a form of public financing, financing out of tax revenues, but the form it would take is every citizen is uh, given a voucher, is given a, um, a, the right to make a contribution to a campaign. Uh, you can only use this voucher to make a contribution to the campaign, and when you make that contribution, the campaign can then cash that voucher in for money. Uh, and this would provide a kind of equality. The money would have to come from somewhere. The money, as I said, would come from tax revenues, but its distribution would be determined by the individual decisions of citizens, and they would uh, be putting, put on equal footing. Everyone would have a voucher that would be equal in amount. That's a proposal that comes around a lot. I think it's a, I think it's a, um, uh, a pretty good uh, uh, proposal. Another way of doing this would be um, <coughs> roughly the same, would be to give campaigns a subsidy that was geared to the number of small contributions that they got. 
So you would say to a campaign, we want a list from you of how many people contributed $100 or less. And for everyone who contributed $100 or less, we, the government, will give you $1,000, something like that. Um, so if someone gives you $5,000, uh, you don't get a subsidy, or you only get one subsidy. And this will give campaigns an incentive to raise small donations from lots of people, and people can register um, other views uh, that way, and that will also provide an element of, of equality. Um, so I think these are, these are decent proposals. The, the problem with it is it will only ensure equality if you make it the exclusive channel of getting money to campaigns. And there are lots of ways that people are determined to evade limits like this to funnel money to campaigns or to candidates. Lots of ways in which you can make the campaigns cheaper by making in-kind contributions. Instead of writing a check, you provide um, uh, uh, labor. Um, you have people, volunteers, man the phone banks. Uh, that's how you make your contribution. Um, uh, or uh, you uh, provide a vacation home where the candidate can stay um, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're wealthy. You have to figure out some way to police that and make sure that the money wasn't getting to campaigns in other ways, uh, you know, including expenditures in support of the campaign. Okay, I'll, you know, I, I can only make a limited contribution to you. I can only give the campaign a voucher but I will go out and spend my money on a vigorous advertising campaign to support, uh, to support your candidacy. So that would be a problem. The second problem which really looms over this area is the problem of incumbent protection. Incumbency is a huge advantage to uh, candidates. It gives them name recognition, gives them access to fundraising, um, uh, and a big argument for allowing large expenditures is it equalizes the advantage of incumbency. This is an, a, sort of an example of why, you know, in a courtroom it's easy to say 30, si 30 minutes aside. In the political realm, um, not so easy to decide what equality is. And if someone says, listen, I'm challenging an incumbent who's held this seat for a long time, is very well known throughout the congressional district, no one knows me. True equality means I ought to be able to spend a lot more money. That's not an implausible argument, and it's very difficult to know how to, um, how to work that out. The way to, the way, one way to think about this, if you buy my idea that this is really about voting as much as it is about speech, and the rule in voting is one person, one vote, one way to think about, about this is, is this. Um, you know, one person, one vote, the Supreme Court insisted on that, on that rule in 1964, and it's been very, very successfully implemented in the sense that, that congressional districts and state legislative districts really are drawn in a very precise way. And, and districts contain the same number of people, almost down to the single person. Uh, and that regime has been very rigorously implemented. But what we've got, consistent with that, legally consistent with that regime, is gerrymandering, where district lines, while they conform to one person, one vote, they're drawn the way that predictably produces certain political outcomes. Um, and that's formally equal. Every district has the same number of votes, but some political parties or some interest groups are systematically over and underrepresented because of the way the lines are drawn. Well, you could gerrymander a regime of campaign contributions in the same way. Everyone gets an equal amount, but you could figure out a way to protect incumbents or to advance certain interests depending on, um, on what sort of expenditures um, were allowed. So insisting on one person, one vote doesn't necessarily get you the kind of equality you want uh, in either realm. Um, okay, so where does this leave us, apart from saying that the foundations um, are wrong? I think where, what I'd say is this. Uh, I would say what the attitude the courts ought to take is quite different from the attitude manifested in a case like Citizens United, which is very aggressive, very interventionist by the court, filled with a lot of, um, of uh, rhetoric about uh, the First Amendment and what an affront this was to the First Amendment. Um, I, I think the attitude court should have is, look, we're going to allow legislatures to try things as long as they are plausible ways of equalizing people's voice in the political system. We'll see how it works. We can get data on whether there's a problem of incumbent protection, a problem of certain groups uh, effectively gerrymandering the process. We can actually look at this and see whether certain things have this effect. It turns out, for example, that limits on corporate contributions were not an effective means of incumbent protection. There's just no evidence that they were, and the court should have left them alone um, because it's a vaguely equalizing thing. There's no evidence that it does any harm. Why should the court intervene on the basis of this abstract idea that it's just speech when it's not just speech? It also has something to do with voting. Um, so I would say that rather it should be a more passive judicial role looking for specific distortions. The courts should stay on the sidelines and adopt the kind of 
you know, if it seems to be working pretty well, we're going to leave it alone, even if it can't be abstractly, uh, abstractly justified. That sort of approach instead of this rigid equality, no, corruption, yes, contributions can be limited, expenditures cannot be, instead of using those rigid categories. Okay, let me just conclude on one, on one um, kind of a maybe optimistic note. Um, the, the system of campaign financing, turn, it turns out to be extremely complex, and it's very hard to predict how any one thing is going to influence it. Um, uh, for example, uh, there were widespread predictions that the opening up of doors to independent contributions, independent expenditures after Citizens United would be a terrible problem for the Democrats in the last election, helpful for the Republicans, because the Republican donor base tends to include wealthier individuals. Um, that, so far as we can tell, certainly at the presidential level, that was just not a problem. Um, uh, now, what, what, whether that is attributed, whether that's because it's just not a problem, uh, or because you had a candidate who was especially popular, President Obama, and you had a campaign team that was sort of ahead of the other side and using the internet, which is also possible, um, we don't know. Um, but things like that, that the effects that people expected to see from changes in the law turned out to be swamped by the fact that the Obama campaign figured out a way to use the internet in both elections very effectively. Um, maybe they have an innate advantage because of the nature of their support. Maybe this was just a matter of the other side will catch up. Uh, we don't know. But the system is, is very hard to predict just because there's so many um, uh, variables. So I would say it's a mistake to be alarmist about Citizens United or about the, the, the course that the law has taken. But having said all of that, you know, rule by the people does not mean rule by the people with the most money. Um, I, that, that I think we could say with some confidence. And until the law reflects that, I think we have to, which the Supreme Court has not allowed it to reflect, um, I think we have to say that there's a bit of a threat to, uh, to democracy. So thanks, and we have time for questions. <laughs> Principle, yes. I mean, I think this is the kind of thing where you have to um, see what what the regulators did and see whether it actually did distort things. So, right? Would, can you possibly imagine a regime in which the government would say no newspapers cannot endorse candidates um, uh, anymore? Hard to imagine. But you know, there are limits on the ability of, for example, people who take money from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. There are limits on their ability to editorialize. Um, uh, so the idea of restricting some of this is not, uh, not, not totally unheard of. So I think what I'd say is let's see what is done, see if it looks like a sensible way of dealing with the problem of inequality or not. If it has distorting effects, don't allow it, but otherwise let the legislature take its course. As a, as a matter of political realities, I think we, you know, the, the government has shown no inclination to try to keep independently owned newspapers from endorsing candidates, and I don't think it would, um, it would happen. So I think that, that's the way I think about it, as to say, in principle, is this an issue? Yeah, in principle, it's an issue. Practically speaking, are we going to see a crackdown on this? No, we're not going to see it. If we did see it, what should our reaction be? Um, you know, I think I, I would say the court should stay out of the picture, uh, and let the, unless there's a sign that this is actually distorting the, uh, distorting the political process. It's, a good, a good, it's an excellent point. There must be some non-excellent points waiting to be made. <laughs> Uh, there are other um, democracies that have stricter campaign finance regulations. So do you have any examples of ones that are working well? Or like, can you draw instances from the experience of other countries regulating this area? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is an obvious area in which some work needs to be done. I, don't, I just don't have the knowledge. The question was about what other countries do. And do we have uh, sort of examples of other countries that have regulated campaign finance better than ours? What you see, so far as I know, and that's, is, that's not very far, what you see in other countries is two things. You see a, a much greater degree of public financing, and you see much shorter campaigns. Um, and part of that, I think, is because of the parliamentary versus the presidential 
system where if you have a parliamentary system where the prime minister can kind of decide when the campaign's going to begin. Um, uh, so, so there's less of a run-up than there is um, in our system. Uh, and that produces shorter campaigns. Otherwise, I think it's a bit of a puzzle why you see shorter campaigns in, um, uh, in other countries. But when you have a shorter campaign and a higher degree of public financing, these issues are muted to some degree. Now, whether they, you still, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether there is a case to be made that, yeah, you get shorter campaigns and um, money is less of an influence and you also get a lot more, uh, a lot harder to turn out incumbents. I don't, I don't know the answer to that uh, in other countries. Yeah. Um, wouldn't the system like uh, allowing states or allowing the federal government to try out different regulatory regimes to see what works and what actually can, can influence uh, campaign finance turn the judiciary into just campaign regulators? So they would look and they would see, you know, what empirical evidence they want to look at, and then they, you know, they would just choose out of that empirical evidence what they think is a bigger influence or a smaller influence, and it would just be a matter of uh, judicial, uh, I guess, uh, discretion on what they actually want to enforce or not enforce. Yeah, there, it would. It would. You're right that the regime would look a lot more like the judiciary as a regulatory agency than it does now, uh, where they'd be weighing evidence, trying to make a judgment. How is this working? That's right. Um, I guess what I want to say is I think that is a better role for them to play than what they're now doing, which what they're now doing is more kind of at least a sort of a traditional conception of what courts do. There are principles, there are lines, and you cannot cross this line. Um, but I think the nature of this problem, two things about the nature of this problem make that a better, uh, mitigate the problems, the, the issue, you've, the, the, the concern with the issue you've identified. Um, uh, one is I think the regime of principle just doesn't work. I think the problem is too complicated for, for to say what the court has said. Corruption, yes. Equality, no. Contribution and limitations, yes. Expenditure limitations, no. It's just too complicated a system uh, uh, for that, for these, these reasons. The considerations are more complicated. The second thing is, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to say we will let the politicians who actually know how this works and have to respond to the voters, we'll let them take the first crack. But then we want someone looking over their shoulder um, and saying, no, 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 you, no, no, we're not, we're not going to let you get away with that. Um, and the idea of having life tenure judges looking over their shoulders, I think that's not a crazy regime to have the first crack taken by politicians and then someone with a, an eye out for abuses kind of providing this sort of pragmatic oversight. Um, you know, I think if you were designing a regime from scratch, that's not, that's not, that's an, that would be an appealing way to, um, uh, to do it. It would put the judges in much more of a kind of a, the role of sort of ad hoc, um, um, the sort of role you might think of as a technocratic agency uh, being in rather than uh, um, the enforcer of principle. I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's right. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't think, I mean, it's hard, for me at least, it's hard to think of a better way to do it than that. And there's something to be said for the idea that, uh, um, you know, it, it's, if, you, if, you, if you charge life-appointed people with, you know, just make sure there are no abuses going on out there, that you'll get decent results. Yeah, that's, I, don't, I don't know enough to know whether, well, there are a couple of issues you'd have to get through. You'd have to make sure you're really comparing apples with apples if you're dealing with a country with a different kind of system, a different party structure. That can really affect the nature of campaign finance when the parties are disciplined and the parties really run the show to a greater extent than they do here. Um, that can affect things. The country's smaller, obviously, that affects things. More homogeneous, that affects things. The income distribution is more compressed than ours is which many advanced uh, industrial societies are, that'll affect things. You have to control for all of those, uh, those variables before you could decide that some other system was, was superior. What you do see in other countries, as I said before, is much more emphasis on public financing. And that's a sort of an uh, obvious way to mitigate these concerns with inequality would be to have some greater degree of public financing. Uh, but that poses its own issues about incumbent protection. Um, uh, um, so that's, I mean, it, it, part of the, a lot of this is my own ignorance about what goes on elsewhere, but I do think even if you wanted to look into this, you would have some, uh, some difficult issues about making sure that the comparison, um, the comparison works. Yeah. I see other equality problems beyond campaign contribution from the average candidate planning their presidential run, like a 
12 years out mm -hmm. to some candidates who can manipulate things like national media attention in a way that you can't really put a number on it too easily. So like Chris Christie is, you know, getting himself national media attention it, for things that like the average governor wouldn't normally get it for. Do you see these equality problems ever going away or are we just gonna be like this forever? <laughs> um, I, I think, I, this is I think, the, the point is I think about how difficult it is to translate the concern with equality, which we do acknowledge in these kind of very um, structured forums, like an argument in the court, translating that into the political realm. I think that's a hard problem. Incumbency is probably the biggest single piece of that. But you're right, some people are better at getting media attention. Uh, or if the Romney campaign had said, you know, we should be able to raise more money because, let's face it, that other guy is a lot cooler than our, I mean, really. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so we really should be able to get more money to compensate for a very severe coolness deficit that we are operating. Uh, well, it's true. I mean, I don't know what side you're on, but I mean, really, facts are facts. Um, uh, um, so stuff like that. You know, one person is more charismatic. One person has a, access to a bigger pool of volunteer labor. You know, yes, your supporters are less wealthy, so they're willing to spend time working. Our people are, you know, they're, they're, their time is worth more to them. So all those inequalities persist. That's why I think what you really have to try to do is to operate, you know, saying, well, you know, the government can simply equalize things. While that's the principle, um, there is a reasonable objection to that, which is, wait a second, that's going to be a lot harder in practice than in principle and can lead to abuses. But I think the solution to that is to say, okay, let's wait until there are abuses. And if there are abuses, we'll try to rectify them. But as far as bringing about absolute equality, uh, uh, no, never, never. You can't do that. You can't correct for all the ways, and it's not even clear that you'd want to, uh, or what you would identify as an illegitimate inequality. Um, uh, someone's more eloquent, more articulate. Is that that's uh, inequality? Is that a bad? It's probably not a bad thing. There, there are two issues. One issue is you, you'd have to decide. I mean, if you, this is actually sort of arguing against, the, uh, arguing against the concern with equality, but again, on the level of pragmatics, not on the level of principle. You have to say, well, what kinds of inequalities do we want to say are good? I mean, it's, it's actually it's fine that he has an advantage because he is smarter, more focused, better able to speak to people's concerns, seems more in touch with people. Um, though it's fine he has an advantage for that reason. Um, so you have to sort those out, those things from he has an advantage because he has a bigger donor base or wealthier donor base. Um, and then you figure out how to, how to have to figure out how to address it. And I just don't see any way of doing that other than a, or the best, a better way of doing that than a kind of a, a trial and error um, uh, muddle through sort of approach. I don't think the, um, the rigid framework the court has set out is, is better. Yeah? How would disclosure requirements fit into your regime? Because it seems like under your conception, disclosure regimes actually don't have much justification because right, we don't tell people who you vote for uh -huh. as a way of figuring out where your influence lies. Right? It's much more of a corruption issue where the idea is we're OK with you giving money as long as everyone knows how much to whom and when it happened. Yeah. So how would that, how would your regime treat? Yeah, I, that's a good, I haven't actually thought, I should have thought this through, but I haven't thought it through. So let me, let, let me try to sort of give you something off the, off the top of my head. I think to the, extent, it, to the extent you have a regime that actually does bring about a degree of equality, I think your suggestion is right, that disclosure becomes no less of a concern, maybe even not an appropriate uh, concern. Um, that the argument for disclosure is, well, we don't have equality yet, so the best we can do is to say, uh, is to be able to point to some candidate and say, um, uh, we want to attack you because you are taking advantage of the uh, wealth of your contributors, um, uh, as well as dealing with possible quid pro quo, which would be an independent reason for doing it. But I think that's, that's you're right, that to the extent you see this as a voting matter, then the argument for disclosure becomes um, weaker, and to the extent there's equality, it's hard to see why there should be. If, uh, like, Bloomberg or, you know, or somebody super rich 
ran for president and paid for the whole thing himself. You know, under the current, you know, focus on corruption, that'd be fine, right? You know, he, he's saying he can't, you know, be bought. Mm -hmm. But under your proposal where mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, th that doesn't seem fair and all that. So would you want to restrict how much he could spend on himself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good question. There was a, there was a, um, a piece of the campaign finance laws that tried to address just that situation. And the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. And I think, their, I think the rationale they gave was not a good one, but the concern was legitimate. So let me be specific about that. There was a provision that was called, actually called the Millionaire's Amendment. And millionaire is kind of naive. Uh, a million, because that is yeah, it's going to take a, a billionaire to finance a presidential campaign out of his pocket. Um, uh, what it did, it didn't try to restrict the amount people could spend out of their own pockets. But what it did was to say that if your opponent is spending a lot out of his own pocket, then people can contribute more to your campaign than they would otherwise be allowed to. So if there was a, I forget what the limit was back in the, in, when the Millionaire's Amendment was enforced, but now there's a $5,000 limit. So you might say, for example, once your opponent spends more than X dollars out of his own pocket, your contributors can give 10000 His can only give five, but yours can give 10 um, or 15 or something like that. Um, that was the Millionaire's Amendment. The Supreme Court struck that down. Uh, said it was unconstitutional, and said it was unconstitutional. Basically, it, it sort of said, this is an effort to equalize things, and we don't allow equality. Had they instead, which I, which I think is not the right way to think about this, um, the response was, I mean, I'm not giving them quite enough credit. I don't, I mean, I, but, but uh, the sort of the, the, the way they spelled it out was, this is going to discourage people from spending money out of their own pockets, because they know they won't get as much bang for the buck. If I spend more out of my own pocket, all that's going to happen is my opponent will be able to raise more money, so I'm not going to spend as much. So it has this chilling effect on um, expenditures in support of the candidacy. Uh, um, but I think that's because that is sort of rooted in the idea that the concern with equality is improper. I don't think that was the right way to think about it. Uh, had, had the justification been, uh, and it, had this justification been supported by data, had the justification been, you know, actually self-financed, really rich people are um, among those who can most successfully challenge incumbents. And so the real concern about the Millionaire's Amendment is it's an incumbency protection device. Had that been the argument, that's an argument worth thinking about. Now, it's just a, it's just a claim. You'd have to back it up and show that, no, really, this does put a crimp in people's ability to challenge incumbents. But if you could do that, I think that's the way I would, I would think about that problem. Is this an example of incumbent protection? And if it is, then it shouldn't be allowed. If it's not, then. Um, uh, then it's an effort to equalize, and I would say that's 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 uh, that's fine. Yeah, that's Richard. Uh, foreign nationals can't contribute to campaigns, but they can't contribute to PACs either. But yet, foreign nationals have constitutional protection. So I'm wondering why Buckley versus Vallejo, which says you know the right to give money is the right to free speech, doesn't apply to foreign nationals, and if that is it, can that reasoning Yes, I think actually one big vulnerability in Citizens United is the logic of Citizens United suggests that foreign nationals and foreign corporations also should be allowed to, con to contribute money or spend money, not contribute money, but spend money in support of candidates. Um, Why can they not donate to um, uh, I, I don't think there's a good. I don't think there's a good explanation. There was actually a case. <laughs> Uh, involving a foreign corporation that came before the D.C. Circuit in the wake of Citizens United, in which the corporation said basically your argument and said, look, Citizens United says uh, corporations are like uh, other speakers. This is a restriction on political speech. Um, uh, the, what matters is the speech, not the identity of the speaker. You can't restrict speech because of the identity of the speaker. All this stuff is in Citizens United. Why doesn't that apply to us? And the D.C. Circuit came up with some arguments and rejected it. Um, I think what you're seeing, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's a kind of a thing where the, the, the people who like what the court is doing and throwing the doors open wide to um, campaign contributions don't want to throw it open wide to foreign corporations. 
uh, so they're comfortable with this outcome. And the other side thinks, well, yeah, I mean, we don't even like the idea of domestic corporations contributing. So of course, you don't like the idea of foreign corporations contributing. So you have this agreement that is not justified in principle. Um, and you know, you could say, look, foreigners can't vote. And so if they can't vote, they shouldn't be influencing our elections. Well, corporations can't vote either. Um, labor unions can't vote. Um, so that's not a satisfactory line. So I think conceptually, it is actually very, it's, a, it's an embarrassment for the court's regime that foreign nationals are not allowed to make expenditures uh, in support of uh, campaigns, to, for example, by contributing to PACs. I think it's not, it's not adequately justified. And if you tried to justify it, I think you'd be forced to recognize that this isn't just about speech, it's partly about voting, and then that would open up these other, these other issues. I think we have time for, yeah, one more. Yeah, ma'am. Uh -huh. It seems to me that a system based on vouchers where you're restricting or otherwise regulating the in-kind contributions and volunteering would potentially explode these kinds of campaigns, but that overall the system might ratchet down the expense based on no expenditures from these organizations. So I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the impact on the, the magnitude of campaigns, but also maybe the perception of that magnitude as well. Yeah, this is a very, the question is about the magnitude of spending. and and. Whether a you know, voucher regime would probably ratchet down the amount of expenditures, I think that's right. Um, I just find this really hard, a really hard problem to get a handle on whether the, the magnitude alone should be a, a concern. I mean, I'm comfortable saying, you know, to whatever extent, whatever magnitude it should be, we should try to figure out a way so that people can contribute uh, equally to that. Um, you know, whether spending a lot of money on a campaign that might not be a bad thing. It might be a good thing. More advertisements, more sort of engagement, more people making phone calls and stuff like that. Maybe that's a, um, uh, maybe that's a good thing. I guess I'd want to say an independent concern with just how much is being spent with that resource allocation. I guess I want to say that that shouldn't be part of the picture, that you shouldn't allow um, a, a rationale, one of, the ra one of the acceptable rationales for regulation in this area should not be, we think too much money is being spent on campaigns. I, I, I don't see the argument for that. The argument that it's maldistributed, that I see. Um, um, but I wouldn't see that. And then sort of once you had a regime of some kind of equality, you could let it go to its natural level. You could see what people wanted to, to do with their uh, resources. I think that would be the, the way to, to think about it. But I don't, I don't quite see the basis for the argument that there, it might be there's too much. It might be we could, you know, we'd have a healthier system with fewer ads, but I, you know, but I don't, I don't see the argument uh, for that. I don't know, I don't know how, you'd, how you would make that case. I think we have to break. Thank you so much for coming.